okay the japanese trains I apologize if the train leaves early so okay so one o'clock now uh welcome to uh, everyone attending this uh, webinar this is a, a landmark webinar in many ways at least as far as i know certainly in neurosurgery we have got a, a great lecture you know, from a distinguished neurosurgeon dr lisa baird on an important area pediatric brainstem tumors and we have also a distinguished multidisciplinary team to discuss the various aspects and controversies uh, uh, regarding pediatric brainstem tumors and what are what's what are the future avenues to explore um first of all i will introduce uh, dr lisa baird dr lisa baird is um, a consultant neurosurgeon uh, and also the co-director of the neuro oncology uh, neurosurgery program at the famed boston children's hospital it's great to have her here with us uh, and uh, in, in terms of our faculty uh, uh, we will start with dr jillian whitfield she's at christie's it's um, uh, one of the largest if i think it's the largest uh, neuro oncology department in the uk and um, uh, it's uh, uh, her expertise in radiation oncology and oncology uh, it will be great to have her thoughts on the, during the discussion and we have got dr suresh mukherjee uh, he's a doyen of neuroradiology um, and uh, he's one of the few uh, uh, doctors i know continuously for the last 30 years so it's always a great honor and privilege to have him with us then dr jason uh, Chiang, he's coming from um, St. Jude's. He's a neuropathologist. Um, his, uh, his work is, um, has been uh, very um, uh, impactful, and uh, St. Jude is another powerhouse of uh, pediatric neuro-oncology, and great to have Dr. Chiang with us. Um, uh, Dr. Steve Lois has given his apologies um, uh, and we have got three neurosurgeons in uh, uh, I've already uh, introduced Dr. Baird. Uh, we have got um, Professor uh, Chandrasekhar Diapujari. He's coming from India. I'm sure everyone in this uh, meeting uh, will know Professor Diapujari, past president of uh, ISPN. And uh, I'm sure he's past president of many things, uh, and including, I think, the NSI. Uh, and um, so it's great to have Professor Dia Pujari, who has always been supportive of the list. Sir. Thank you, sir, very much. And also Dr. Boop, once again, don't need introduction for Dr. Boop, uh, past president of the ISPN, past president of the AANS, and once again, been a staunch supporter of the list sir, for several years. So Dr. Baird, uh, um, it's a real honor and privilege to have you with us, and we are all Greatly looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Naren. Let me get my um, screen up here. Well, it's a real honor to be asked to um, speak for one of the listserv lectures. I just want to thank Naren for inviting me and I really always enjoy these lectures. I learn so much from all of the expertise in this group and enjoy all the, the emails and links. And, and it's really just been um, a very nice thing to be a part of, so thank you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about pediatric brainstem tumors. And I think for those of us that take care of a lot of these children, um, we recognize that every tumor in a child is completely unique and having all of the kind of skill set of being able to access the different parts of the brain is so important for taking care of this patient population. And there's really nowhere more daunting than the brainstem. And so I think this is an important topic to go over, an important topic to constantly be learning about. Um, I certainly continue to learn about it. And, um, and so it was uh, looking, I was very much looking forward to giving this talk. I have no disclosures. Uh, brainstem tumors are certainly the minority of the tumors we see in the pediatric central nervous system. They comprise about 10% of all of them. 
And the majority of those are the DIPGs, the diffuse midbrain gliomas. But we also see a myriad of other diagnoses. Um, most of the rest of them are low-grade gliomas. Many are the glioneuronal um, tumors, but we see um, embryonic tumors, we see germ cell tumors, um, we see a myriad of others. When we're thinking about the surgical considerations for tumors in the brainstem, especially in children, um, we have to remember that the brainstem has the most complex and densely eloquent anatomy in the central nervous system. Surgery really requires a very detailed understanding of brainstem anatomy and the nuclei and the tracts and the surrounding cranial and vascular anatomy. Um, and we, we also really kind of need to understand tumor behavior, which tumors infiltrate, which tumors grow and can kind of push and distort normal anatomy away. Historically, these have been considered inaccessible, but as we've really learned more about the anatomy of the brainstem, learned more about tumor behaviors, um, had a lot of good people doing a lot of good work in this area, they really have become established safe entry zones um, that can access nearly every part of the brainstem. And so we can do a lot more in this area than in the past. Um, really understanding the individual tumor anatomy and how it's distorted uh, surrounding structures is, is very key for planning surgical approaches. Um, and there really have to be clear indications and clear goals going into these surgical procedures that balance the benefit to the patient with the morbidity that will undoubtedly be present um, when working in this area as a risk. I'll also note that a lot of the a lot of the safe entry zones that have been established um, have really been used in the adult world for cavernomas. I think that's that's one of the more common things that has been described in the literature and that is kind of discussed when talking about brainstem um, surgery. And uh, it doesn't always carry over well to our pediatric population. Um, and so it's just one thing to keep in mind. Um, and I, I do think it's so important to really consider how the tumor has affected the anatomy in these areas. The surgical tools we use for these types of procedures are so critical. Um, neuroanesthesia, really having an experienced person, especially for a, a surgical pr procedure in the brainstem area is key. I mean, you can get the hemodynamic liability. Uh, you can need really um, critical adjustments with with brain relaxation, um, almost all of these patients are being monitored with neuromonitoring, um, with the SSEPs, MEPs, our cranial nerve EMG, and it's critical to have an anesthesiologist that is comfortable with adjusting the anesthesia to really optimize our neuromonitoring. Um, the neuromonitoring really is one of the most important advances that allows us to operate in this area safely, and it's so critical to have a reliable team, good communication in the operating room, um, the ability to hear them it needs to be quiet when these cases are happening so that you can hear when something is changing. Um, it's really paramount to minimizing morbidity um, in these patients to have a good neuromonitoring team. Other surgical tools, um, our advanced imaging has really allowed us to see more about um, the tractography in this area and to, to really plan around that. We can see the distortion of the tracts and kind of know which tumors are, are infiltrative, um, and we've really learned a lot about a lot about these tumors with our advanced imaging. Um, we've found that the intraoperative MRI um, has really become an indispensable tool for many of our brain tumors, but I would say, say especially in the brainstem. Um, we have we're fortunate enough to have two intraoperative um, MRIs at Boston Children's, and really just have found them to be a game changer with what we can do in the operating room. The appropriate instruments, also key. Um, as we all know, the right instrument can make a world of difference. And when you're operating in a deep space, um, it, it really is helpful to have the, the deep, long um, micro instruments, lighted sections, lighted bipolars, some flexible low profile instruments um, can really help optimize these procedures in a very meaningful way. 
There are um, different classification systems for brainstem tumors. And this comes from um, a paper by Dr. Jallo, where he kind of summarizes these classification systems. But they all are kind of based around these concepts of is the tumor diffuse or is it focal? Is it intrinsic? Is it exophytic? Um, and the anatomic location within the brainstem. And so those are kind of the key things to consider uh, when looking into these tumors. I'm going to go through just kind of some of the, the um, basic anatomic regions where we take care of tumors in these patients, and we'll, we'll show some illustrative examples. Certainly not going to touch on every single um, entry zone or every single location, but um, you know, some, some are more common in our field than others. For midbrain tumors, um, there are dorsal approaches and ventral approaches that we can access midbrain. The dorsal approaches, um, the occipital interhemispheric transtentorial approach is uh, typically my, my go-to for these. Um, I know everyone has their own preferences here and a lot of people prefer the supracerebellar infratentorial approach. Um, I find that that approach can be uh, very helpful with endoscopic assistance when it's used for the ventral approaches, the orbitozygomatic, the infratemporal, um, the interhemispheric, and occasionally the endoscopic transventricular approaches can really get you to all areas of the midbrain. For focal midbrain tumors, um, this is an example of a child. This is a seven-year-old boy who presented with a tremor and a head tilt. Um, you can see this very focal tumor with a cystic component in the right midbrain um, towards the dorsal aspect of it. And uh, I did this case through an occipital transtentorial approach, certainly could have been done through an infratemporal supracerebellar approach. And when considering the safe zones for this approach, um, really are pro we're probably two possible safe zones to enter the midbrain. One is the intercollicular. For the intercollicular approach, um, right between the, the um, in the middle of the quadrigeminal plate, there are sparse crossing fibers there. Um, your anterior limit is the cerebral aqueduct. Um, and it is approached, especially if the tumor has kind of thinned out the anatomy there that can be used. The lateral mesencephalic sulcus, which runs between the medial geniculate body and the trochlear nerve is um, also a nice approach. And um, in this particular case, the Lateral mesencephalic sulcus was what we entered, and it certainly had been very thinned out there and was an easy entrance point into that, into that with a really minimizing disruption of normal tissue. But those are kind of the two main safe entry zones to the dorsal midbrain. This is another um, example of a focal midbrain tumor that's, that was more ventral in appearance. Um, this was a nine-year-old boy who presented with arm weakness. For the ventral safe entry zones, um, there's a small zone in the in interpedincular sulcus um, and also the anterior mesencephalic um, or periocular sulcus, um, which was what we used for this tumor. Uh, that anterior mesencephalic entry zone is going to be lateral to the oculomotor nerve and it's going to be located between the posterior cerebral artery and the superior cerebral artery. It will be medial to the cortical spinal tract. Very important to look at the tractography beforehand to see how that tract has been distorted so it's not disrupted. And um, in this case, again, you could see kind of a thinned out area at the front where the tumor um, came very nicely to the surface right in the area of the anterior mesencephalic uh, entry zone and our cortical spinal tract have been pushed quite laterally. Um, we were able to remove the majority of this tumor. Uh, the, it, it did have a small, some small recurrences a few years later, and he became symptomatic again from the cyst. And at that time, things had kind of collapsed in that area to the point where um, we, we ended up treating that cyst with an omaya, and he had some serial taps for a few months, and then things really have stabilized without any further treatment for him so far. I think the infiltrative tectal gliomas, um, a diagnosis we're probably, um, we see a little bit more commonly. Um, this is an example of an 18-year-old male 
who uh, had been diagnosed at the age of five with this very small tectal glioma and kind of the classic obstructive hydrocephalus appearance. He had undergone an endoscopic third ventriculostomy and was monitored. And, and you can see this very significant progression from the age of five to the age of 18 and uh, really did not want anything done until he became symptomatic. And he became symptomatic when these cystic components really started to grow because they, there was a more rapid growth um, with the fluid buildup. He eventually developed dorsal midbrain syndrome and was convinced to have something done. Um, we debulked this tumor and really, really didn't feel that we could only treat it medically because we felt his symptoms had come on with the development of these cysts and really felt we needed to surgically drain those cysts. So we did do an open approach. This was done through an occipital interhemispheric transtentorial approach and we're able to get into those cysts. Uh, this, this was a low grade glioma, yes. Um, we're able to get into those cystic spaces and debulk the majority of the solid tumor, although it had certainly infiltrated into the rest of the midbrain and along kind of the lateral thalamic walls. So left a left the infiltrated portion. And um, he has also done, done very well. Sometimes with these low-grade tumors, um, you debulk the majority of it. And as we know, the remainder uh, can very frequently just become senescent and they don't require further treatment. So um, we'll just observe them. And at that point, we'll have tissue if they do progress and they can go into uh, medical management with low-grade chemotherapy options or targeted inhibition. Another infiltrative tumor that was um, exophytic from the tectal glioma. This was a five-year-old girl. She had progressed from the age of two. Um, typically, we probably would have started with low-grade chemotherapy options with her, but there were social situations that made that impossible. And um, so we did end up approaching this um, with surgical debulking. Um, because her tectum and what we felt was functional brainstem was dorsal to the tumor, this was a case we did endoscopically transventricular. And this, you can see that tract right there, that's from her prior ETV. Um, she had a more ventral approach for a debulking of the tumor and were able to really get the majority out except what appeared to be infiltrative to the midbrain and tectum. And she's had very good control since that time. There are some exophytic tectal gliomas that really you can take out completely and can be uh, gross total resections and curative procedures. Um, this was an 18-year-old male. He had had a prior uh, biopsy in the past and years later became uh, recurrent and progressive with this large cystic progression. Um, this was approached through an occipital interhemispheric transtentorial approach, and we were able to um, really nicely take this entire thing out um, with a very nice plane with some of these exophytic dorsal tectal gliomas. So moving on to the, the pontine gliomas, um, obviously these um, can be a little bit more challenging and daunting in the pons. Uh, I find that the um, fourth ventricular mapping and fourth ventricular safe zones um, tend to be probably some of the more morbid approaches. They nearly all have symptoms, even if temporary after those approaches. When possible, I do try to avoid them. Uh, this was a three-year-old boy who, who came to us from an outside hospital. He had undergone um, debulking of this procedure, of, of this tumor, excuse me, through a ventrolateral approach um, because they had followed the exophytic component of the tumor in. And unfortunately, it was so nearby his cranial nerve 7, 8 function, right, right at the dorsal root entry zone of those nerves, and also very near the cortical spinal tract that he was left with quite significant deficits. Um, you can see that small area of debulking and I think they had monitoring changing and appropriately backed out. Um, this tumor ended up being an ETMR. And uh, those tumors, as we know, um, are very aggressive tumors and really require good surgical debulking um, if they are going to have any meaningful response to their adjuvant therapy and even then, um, have very poor survival rates. Uh, but this was a patient who uh, we wanted to debulk further before he went um, forward with the rest of his adjuvant therapy. And the approach I took here was a middle cere cerebellar peduncle approach. Um, you can see on some of his tractography how the, the tracts are being distorted around the tumor. 
Um, we did not feel like this was um, mostly an infiltrative tumor. It was mostly a focal tumor and approached this through the middle cerebellar uh, peduncle and were able to really resect the majority of the tumor um, until we started to get into some bears dropping on the other side. Um, keep in mind that he had come in with a cranial nerve eight deficit on the right side. And so I was very cautious when his bears started to dip a little bit on the left side. I did not want to leave him with complete hearing loss. And so that's kind of when we backed away and we did leave kind of a rim of tumor and a little bit of tumor over here on the left side that grossly under the microscope also did appear more infiltrative. Um, and there were some subtle changes in the tissue at that point. And so really felt we had resected what was gross disease and left the infiltrative portion behind. So for these pontine tumors, um, and especially this, this tumor specifically, I think the safe entry zones that could be considered here would be the supratrigeminal safe entry zone, um, the peritrigeminal zone, or what I ended up using, which was the middle cerebellar peduncle approach. Um, these, these approaches, the middle cerebral, cerebellar peduncle approach, I think is easiest to achieve with a retrosigmoid craniotomy. Getting to the um, peritrigeminal safe zones really requires a little bit more of an anterior approach, um, either through a subtemporal transpetrosal approach or through a presigmoid retrolabyrinthine approach. Um, the supratrigeminal safe zone entry um, above the trigeminal nerve root entry zone um, uh, allows you to dissect along these transverse pontine fibers behind the cortical spinal tract and make it a safe place to enter the pons. Um, and then this uh, retrosigmoid middle cerebellar peduncle approach is a very nice approach. Uh, approach to enter the lateral pons requires dissecting through the petrosal fissure, which you can easily identify if you go down into the retro, retrosigmoid cistern, um, identify the flocculus, and just follow the anterior inferior cerebellar artery back, and it will travel right along that petrosal fissure, and it can nicely be opened up to allow visibility of the middle cerebellar peduncle um, attachment to the pons and using navigation to confirm that it's a very nice entry point. Uh, it's, it's working anterior to the motor and sensory nuclei of the trigeminal nerve. Uh, it's lateral to the cortical spinal tract. Um, you, you do have to avoid going to infraposterior where one could run into the facial nerve tract or the cochlear nucleus. Um, but in, I think in this case, those structures had um, been pushed away by the tumor and of course, we were dealing with um, preoperative deficits as well. But that's that really is one of my favorite approaches to the pons. Really gives you um, nice access to these large tumors that are more ventral. Diffuse pontine um, tumors. I'm going to return to because I think, as we know, this is such an important diagnosis. And so I'm going to discuss this uh, for for our specialty. I'm going to discuss this a little bit um, at the end in more detail. Um, pontine exophytic tumors um, are um, operative tumors. This is a case of a six-year-old boy who came in with gait dysfunction and some abnormal eye movements, as well as symptoms of hydrocephalus, and had this very large enhancing nodule that was exophytic from the back of the pons. And what, what you don't see here is there was a, an infiltrative component that was non-enhancing, um, but T2 hyperintense. Um, I think this uh, tumor could be approached through the kind of classic suboccipital uh, telovelar approach, um, which is a nice approach to get up into the fourth ventricle. Um, this, these tumors that go very high and kind of open up the top of the fourth ventricle, I find an approach from the top down tends to be an easier recovery for the patient. And I do like that approach um, for the tumors that don't go too lateral. Um, to the contralateral side. So that was the approach we took for this patient. We were able to resect the, the cystic component and all of the solid exophytic um, portion of the tumor while leaving kind of the infiltrative carpet along the back of the pons as well as the infiltrating portion of the tumor that was going deeper into the pons. And that tumor was also a low-grade glioma. Moving down kind of to the uh, 
to the medulla. Uh, the focal intrinsic medullary tumors, um, I think this is uh, even denser and, and more challenging area of the brainstem. Um, this was a 16 year old girl with a medullary astrocytoma. She had a history of a biopsy and chemotherapy management. Um, she had dysfunction from the tumor at baseline um, with her respiratory drive and had a tracheostomy at baseline. She presented um, to us with worsening speech, with worsening swallowing um, abilities, some aspiration events, um, some worsening gait and balance difficulties. And it had significant progression of this tumor that was in her left um, medulla. Um, considering how to enter uh, these, these tumors um, that are focal in the medulla, um, the posterior entry zones are really the sulci. Um, so the posterior median sulcus um, that's found between the um, uh, fasciculus gracilis and below the level of the obex. Um, and oops, too still, lights going off. All right, and al allows you to uh, access the posterior um, medulla. The posterior intermediate sulcus, which is located between the fasciculus gracilis and the fasciculus cuneatus, um, is also a good safe entry zone. And then the posterior lateral sulcus, which is just lateral to the fasciculus cuneatus, um, is also um, an acceptable entry zone into the medulla. For, for this tumor, she had um, some opening in the pia about at the area of the posterior lateral sulcus. So that was our entry into this tumor. And this was, again, a low-grade um, glioma. This was a pilocytic astrocytoma. Pilocytics have very nice planes. And we were able to follow that plane around with stable neuromonitoring and really do a very nice resection of this tumor without causing her any new deficits. The cervicomedullary infiltrating tumors, um, very challenging tumors uh, because they are more infiltrative and they do involve the upper cervical cord. This was a five-year-old girl who came in um, with increasing falls, some sensory disturbance in her arm and some clumsiness in her, in her hand that was new and uh, had this very large infiltrating tumor involving the cervicomedullary junction. Um, we ended up debulking this tumor until we got into some SSCP uh, drops on our neuromonitoring and um, backed off at that point, leaving kind of a carpet of tumor. It did, it did not have good planes, and this ended up being an FGFR altered low-grade glioma. And the FGFR tumors, I find surgically can be particularly challenging. Um, they tend to not have very good planes. Um, they tend to have kind of deep infiltration and are unfortunately not quite as responsive to medical management either. So I find these among the most challenging low-grade tumors to manage. Um, so she is being observed at this point and likely is going to need um, further surgical debulking in the future, given how these tend to behave in their natural history. So I'm gonna move on to talking a little bit about our diffuse ponting gliomas. These are the DIPGs and the DMGs, um, as we know, and a very critical diagnosis when considering pediatric brain tumors. Um, if you look at the data from the Central Brain Tumor Registry of the US, um, cancer death is the third most common cause of all death in children in the US, following firearms and MBAs. It's the second most common cause in the age range of five to nine, which is meaningful because that's the peak incidence for DIPG. Um, CNS tumors um, are the most common cause of cancer death in children, and high-grade gliomas were the cause of the greatest proportion of CNS tumor death. And by site, the brainstem tumors, and in particular, the DIPGs, were the greatest cause of proportion of death. So it really makes, these statistics really make this disease um, deserving of attention um, from our medical and research community. I think it is one of the most impactful from a mortality standpoint for children. And this is no surprise to any of us that take care of these patients. 50% um, of childhood high-grade glioma are DIPG 
Uh, it is nearly exclusive in children. There are some rare exceptions where we find these in adults. Um, as I mentioned, the peak incidence is between five and nine years old, and it's 10% of all pediatric brain tumors. And despite um, many, many attempts at treating these in different ways and many clinical trials, the prognosis for this disease is still dismal. We really have made great strides in pediatric brain tumors as far as um, survival and quality of life in nearly every other diagnostic category except for DIPG. So we, we continue to have a lot of work to do in this category. DIPG classic presentation is a very short onset um, for a symptom timeline, um, usually less than a month. Uh, usually these patients present with cranial neuropathies, gait dysfunction, motor types of uh, problems. Um, and these tumors, as we know, progress very quickly. Historically, uh, these were radiographic diagnoses, and I think that remains so for the vast majority of them. Um, the tumor is centered in the pons. It, um, by, by radiographic definition, will take up more than 50% of the axial diameter, and they classically, as you can see in this image here, engulf the basilar artery. Um, other radiographic features, they tend to be T2 hyperintense, and sometimes they will have some areas of focal contrast enhancement at presentation. Most of the time, those um, areas of, of contrast enhancement show up later down the road. Um, they rarely can metastasize, and so following them with, with spine imaging, especially as they progress further, is important to do. Uh, the only standard of care treatment um, continues to be radiation, um, followed by palliation. And there are some parents still who, who um, make the difficult decision to not treat and will just do palliative care, which I think at this stage it re remains an, an acceptable option um, at this stage of our ability to treat these. Um, everything else really remains in experimental phases. Um, so these patients can get six weeks of focal fractionated radiation therapy, typically with photons, although I think some, some centers are increasingly using protons and they get 54 gray. The radiation therapy does improve their symptoms and their quality of life for a period of time, and it does increase the median survival. And there um, has been some, uh, uh, data on re-irradiation, and we also tend to do that here very, very frequently. Um, re-irradiating re at the first sign of clinical progression will lead to clinical improvement in about 80% of patients, and there continues to be a survival benefit with re-irradiation, with median survival up to 13.7 months from 9 to 10 months. There has been hesitation to biopsy these patients, um, and they, they continue to be considered inoperable because of their infiltrative nature, because of the eloquence of the, the brainstem in this area, and because the tissue um, really has not affected management in the past. And so without a good advantage to the patient, it's, it's hard to ethically justify putting them through um, a biopsy procedure that carries some morbi morbidity. Um, outside of radiation therapy, um, there have been 300 or more clinical trial attempts on different types of other therapies, um, none of which have really been shown to be effective. And that's, that's probably for a multitude of reasons. Um, a lot of the clinical trials were based on adult glioblastoma data. Um, which as we know now um, that we know so much more about the molecular landscape of these tumors does not really apply to these tumors at all. They really are a separate entity. So we had a poor understanding of the very unique biology of these tumors. Um, other reasons why is the blood brain barrier uh, remains very intact in the, brain, in the brainstem. And so drugs do not cross um, at therapeutic concentrations in the brainstem. And so we really have um, struggled to have any other efficacious um, medical management. Um, but that leads us to now. Um, there has been really an explosion of our understanding of the molecular biology of DIPG. 
And there's a huge focus on this right now in our field and we're learning more all the time. Um, and we've learned more about the molecular uh, drivers and subtypes and how meaningful that is when we're talking about high grade glioma in children. Um, this, this really nice paper that came from Chris Jones group uh, looked at large volumes of tissue samples of high grade gliomas and they were really able to show that the underlying drivers mapped not only to different anatomical locations in the brain, but also mapped to um, clinical outcome and survival. The histone mutations um, specifically are very important for this diagnosis. And we know that they co-segregate with distinct um, alterations in downstream pathways. Um, and we also know that the histone well type tumors really tend to be low grade. And so as we, as we know more, um, it's starting to impact our management of these patients. Um, yeah, the somatic histone mutations really was a key discovery um, illustrating the unique biology of these tumors. Um, this is not seen in adult GBMs, just once more underlying that this is really a different type of tumor. Um, the, the behavior and prognosis we know are driven by these histone mutations and the H3K27M mutation is found in about 60% of DMGs and about 80% of DIPGs. Um, so much so that the WHO, when they released the 2021 guidelines, uh, changed the um, specific uh, pathologic um, diagnosis to be molecular so that these, these tumors are now referred to as the H3K27M altered or wild type DMGs. This also has unearthed potential targets. So now that we kind of know a little bit more about the molecular drivers, um, there are some targets that have come to light and are being looked at. The histone deacetylase inhibitors, panabinostat, is one that's been looked at quite a bit, um, onc 201 um, the bromodomain inhibitors. So with these potential targets in related pathways, we're hopefully on, on course to kind of find new treatment options for these patients down the road. So why biopsy? Um, you know, the biopsy has really become quite standard for us um, at our institution. It's not 100%, and we always give parents the option of not doing it, and we're very clear with what they may gain from it. Um, but nearly all of them do elect to biopsy um, at this point. I think the advantages are it will confirm that it is a DMG, and we do know that um, up, up to 10% of classic radiographic VIPGs do not end up being DMG. Um, about 30% of the atypical um, DIPG um, are not DMG. And these tumors have very different outcomes. So I, I put an example here. This is what we would consider an atypical appearance of a DIPG. You do have an infl uh, a pontine expansile mass. It does slightly start to go around the basilar artery. It is taking up more than 50% of the axial dimension of the pons. Um, this was biopsied and found to be a neuroepithelial tumor, a tumor that is treated very differently um, than DIPG. And we ended up being able to take this patient back and resect this nodule on the left side, um, debulked a little bit of this nodule on the right side, and they went into kind of standard neuroembryonal chemotherapy um, treatment pathways and did reasonably well. Um, very different outcome, um, even though it, it does remain a very malignant disease, but very different outcome from DIPG. Um, another advantage to biopsying is if we find other potential targetable genetic alterations. Um, we do see some co-altered tumors where they will have the classic H3K27M mutation, but we may also find a BRAF alteration, an FGFR alteration. And so for those patients, they have the option of going on an inhibitor or some other type of, of treatment if they are found to have um, a co-altered tumor. And then another advantage of biopsy is clinical trial eligibility. There are some clinical trials that require biopsy um, for, their, um, for the patients to be eligible to enroll. Um, the biopsy um, data, I think we have some nice papers showing that it really can be done safely. Um, there was a prospective multi-institutional 
trial that was done um, with many of our institutions in North America, looking at 53 patients that found 92% of the biopsies were diagnostic. Um, when only one patient had a permanent deficit, which is not insignificant to that patient. And is certainly something I bring up with these, with these families that there is risk here. Um, but in general, these uh, were able to be done safely. The Necker group post, um, published a series of 130 patients um, that had undergone biopsy. They had a better diagnostic rate with 100% and they reported a 3.9% with transient morbidity. So I do think this is something that can be done safely. Um, most people do do these through the uh, transpeduncular cerebellar burr holes. They can be done through um, a more vertical approach through a frontal burr hole. Um, but I, I do prefer the transpeduncular approach. I always try to um, look at the distortion of the anatomy as it relates to the seven cranial seven eight um, pathways and kind of aim above or below those pathways depending on where the tumor is largest. And then we'll typically pick the side where it goes most laterally um, into the peduncle. So for instance, in this tumor, I probably would have accessed from the left side. Information that we have gained from these biopsies really has been a critical factor to what I would say is the explosion of clinical trials in the DIPG um, area that we have seen over the past decade. And I think we've been able to design these trials in smarter ways. Um, the current trials now are probably the most promising in a long line of failed trials. Um, they're being done through our consortiums. And um, really there are some, I think, very exciting things in the pipeline for these trials. Certainly nothing that has been a total game changer yet, but you're starting to see some anecdotal improvements in survival um, with all sorts of different things. And a lot of the immunotherapies um, I find to be, to be very exciting, especially the CAR-T trials. Um, we hopefully will be opening ours here in Boston within the year, but right now we have CAR-T trials for DMG. Um, that are available in Seattle and Stanford and in Houston. And I think we're, we're going to see um, better and better uh, trials coming down the road. Um, a lot of good work being done with focused ultrasound to disrupt, disrupt the blood brain barrier in the brainstem um, to then give targeted agents. And uh, just seeing some, some more exciting things come down the road. Um, we also have some uh, great preclinical work. Um, that's being done now that we have access to this tissue and it can really guide um, better science. Um, I have the great fortune to collaborate with um, a really brilliant neuroscientist in our department here at Boston Children's. This is Shin Tang, along with um, Katerina Sarno, uh, who's a postdoctoral fellow and, and Eli Shabo is a research assistant in the lab. And um, I've been able to collaborate with them to generate a neuroimmune competent human brain organoid model using human stem cell derived microglia, human neural progenitor cells and human astrocytes. And so developing kind of a neuroimmune competent um, human brain model um, really allows us to kind of replicate the interactions between the neuroimmunologic microenvironment as the microglia move through the brain um, in this organoid cellular structure and really interact with the other cells. We can then fuse these neuroimmune competent brain organoids to human DIPG spheroids. And that allows us to study the bidirectional interactions um, between the neurons, the microglia, and the tumor cells. Um, we know from some really elegant work done by Michelle Manji at Stanford that the brain tumors very closely interact with surrounding brain neurons um, to promote their growth and to evade immune surveillance. And so having good models that really allow us to study these bidirectional interactions um, in the preclinical world, and that is more aligned with the human environment in which these tumors grow, um, is hopefully really going to allow us to develop more therapeutic screening tools um, that will uh, look at less toxic therapeutic agents and uh, move, move more appropriate things into clinical trials down the road. Um, we still have many challenges for DIPG. Um, and a lot of other things that are exciting in this world. I think liquid biopsy um, is a very exciting thing that's coming down the pipeline. Um, we can find uh, cell-free tumor DNA in CSF and serum. 
Um, it's, it's something that uh, we can't quite find in plasma well yet, but the, the signal to noise ratio is still very low and that signal needs to be amplified. But I think this is something coming down um, the pipeline that, that will be um, a good way to monitor and diagnose down the road less invasively. Um, drug screening and the ability of kind of expediting therapeutic drug development for high grade glioma, glioma is expanding um, in this world. And really the expansion of clinical trials and translational work based on our molecular understanding of this disease um, continues to advance. So lastly, I just want to um, reiterate operating in the brainstem can be done safely with careful planning, careful indications, and really detailed anatomic understanding of this area. Um, and the capacity to do this is critically important when caring for our pediatric patients with all varieties of brain tumors. We have amazing resources that are available to us to do this work and to reference when we are carefully thinking through how to manage these cases. Um, these are only a small representation of some of the resources that are available to us. And I find myself frequently grateful for all of the really meticulous neuroanatomy work that's been done by, by others before us. Um, I'm sure by many on this, on this uh, Zoom and from what I am able to learn from and build on in order to treat my patients safely. So thank you and uh, looking forward to a good discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Baird. That's a fantastic lecture. You took us from the symptoms to all the way to uh, surgery, the, ap the approaches to the brainstem, which is very useful. Uh, I'm sure most of the um, participants would have appreciated that. And also to the the, the difficult uh, DIPGs and and what are the treatments and what are in the pipeline. Thank you very much for this fantastic lecture. So I'm first of all going to uh, ask Dr. Uh, and Dia Pujari, uh, Professor Dia Pujari, uh, could you please comment and your questions for Dr. Bear? Thank you. Well, that was really a comprehensive uh, uh, sort of view of the whole uh, uh, gamut of uh, brainstem tumors in children. And unfortunately, as you have shown, that uh, they are fairly common. Uh, what uh, uh, I liked about it is uh, the specific indications for various brainstem approaches. Many of these approaches, as I think all of us know, have come from the anatomical work and uh, they are being practiced more probably for brainstem cavernomas. And we, we get a lot of... Uh, information but unlike cavernomas i think we have to use our uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, approach based on how localized the tumor is and uh, i think uh, uh, one of the factors which you have shown nicely is uh, uh, the localized versus uh, um, infiltrative tumor and i think that differentiation especially with uh, dti has become a very uh, uh, important thing to uh, sort of uh, uh, look at uh, as a pre-surgical evaluation. So that, that was really very uh, nicely put forward. I'm still a little worried about the medullary tumors, which uh, you have, uh, some of them which you have shown. And I would specifically like to ask about not the classical cervical medullary, but the medullary tumors uh, uh, alone as to what has been your uh, general experience. Are they as benign as they are uh, uh, written about? I, I'm. We have not had the same experience. Yeah, I, I certainly find them daunting. I, I think that the, if I could um, just generalize, I would say that the medullary tumors that tend to uh, communicate down to the cervical medullary junction tend to be more infiltrative than the ones that are really restricted just to the medulla. Um, and those are certainly more challenging. Um, even for the focal tumors in the medulla, um, I think that the ones that really have, have been able to kind of make their own exit point um, 
are the easiest to address. Um, I, I think having very uh, conservative um, reasons to back away with any neuromonitoring changes once you have tissue is always reasonable in those patients given the potential morbidity that can occur. But I do find that many of them do have very nice planes. And in those cases, if those planes are respected and followed, um, you can get nice resections. So every tumor, as we know, is unique. Um, but for the, for the localized vocal um, medullary tumors, I think many of them can be resected. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Dia Pujari. Do you have any follow-up questions, Dr. Dia Pujari? Well, the other question, of course, is uh, uh, there is a trend. Uh, I, I know not enough literature is available, but uh, greater benefit of proton beam radiation versus uh, photon radiation for brainstem tumors. Mm -hmm. um, I, and specifically for, for DIPG, DMG tumors? Not DIPG, even uh, say residual focal tumors, if you are not been able to take it out completely because of some disturbance or. So um, I guess two, two different questions then. For, for non-DIPG focal tumors, um, we, we tend to stay away from radiation in children until they are older. And the reason why is there, there um, are certainly cases that have been radiated at younger ages that will transform into high-grade tumors. I think that's a significant risk with radiating young children. And there are all the other morbidities associated with radiation, but with um, a low-grade tumor that has options for medical management with low-grade chemotherapy regimens or targeted inhibition, um, I certainly uh, feel that we should stay away from radiation until they're older, just because of that risk of transformation. Um, if they have failed those measures um, and are becoming symptomatic and are really out of options, then certainly it's it's something that um, is appropriate to consider. Um, but we tend to be pretty conservative with radiation in the younger um, patients with focal low-grade tumors. For DIPG, I, I think there this is an area of controversy, um, DIPG, DMG for photons versus protons. Um, you know, these are infiltrative tumors and Photons don't have quite the discrete bo uh, boundary that protons do, and you sometimes kind of want that for those infiltrative margins. And so we tend to prefer photons for those, but I think that there is not data really that's that's firm to support that, and many places are, are using protons. Um, and certainly protons will avoid some of the risk to um, the surrounding structures um, around the brainstem that you don't want to get treatment. So. I think there are advantages to both, and we really just don't know. Thank you. Thanks. I think we are going to have the the multidisciplinary MDT discussions, but I think they just fuse together with the questions to Dr. Baird as well. Um, in that spirit, can I ask Dr. Gillian um, Whitfield, who's a radiation oncologist, uh, Dr. Whitfield? No, what's your? Who should be? Who should have been the one answering that question? <laughs> <laughs> and and please uh, give a more intelligent response than I did. <laughs> well, I guess, I mean, I I don't think there's any evidence to favor protons over photons. Certainly, in the worst prognosis tumors, the H three K twenty seven M mutant tumors, um, the dose that we treat to fifty four and gray in 30 fractions typically, although hypofractionated sort of shorter compressed regimes that are equivalent also exist, published by the same author that you showed in your nice slide, um, Geert Janssens from Utrecht. Um, but it really, you know, the problem with those tumors is that they recur in volume, they progress, they metastasize in some cases, and survival, is, as you said, is short. And the doses we give are really very safe to surrounding normal tissues. So within the patient's lifetime are not going to cause another problem. In addition with protons, there is some, there is uncertainty in, in, 
radiobiological uncertainty in exactly what dose we're given, particularly at the end of the proton range. And sometimes we do seem to see slightly more radionecrosis, slightly more treatment-induced swelling, which in the brainstem actually can be particularly difficult. So we would not, in the UK, um, treat with protons um, for these um, H3K27M mutant tumours. They would exclusively get photons. I guess the other thing from a health economic point of view is, you know, the proton therapy is probably at least 10 times as expensive as the photon therapy in, in most, you know, economies. So it's probably one of, you know, the direction of travel, which is going to drive up costs without benefits. And I'd rather see that money spent on, you know, developing drug treatments or be interesting to see what happens with CAR-T therapy for these tumors that actually might offer better chances of survival. For other tumors in the brainstem, the ones where, you know, long-term survival is anticipated, then yes, there is absolutely an indication to consider proton therapy where sparing the surrounding structures like, you know, the hippocampi, the cochleas, et cetera, in the very long term is relevant for that patient and the reduced risk of second malignancy in, in tissues beyond the area you're trying to treat. There are still problems with radiation necrosis, with treatment-related swelling that do also happen with photon therapy, but the impression is, to me, maybe a slightly more with proton therapy, but that is very debated, I have to say, and not clear in the literature. But you might accept some of those things for the long-term benefits of sparing some of the surrounding normal tissues in a child who's going to live long-term. So, yeah, I think there is an indication for those patients. That's great. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Whitfield, do you have a um, question? Mm -hmm. Oh, Dr. Dr. Beard, from her lecture thing. Um, I didn't at the moment. I, I will come back to me again at the end of, of your round. But um, for me, this was very interesting because the surgical approaches are something that I'm not familiar with. So it's very educational for me, but I shall have a think. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Boop, uh, can I please invite you uh, to comment uh, to add any comments on on what Dr. Dia Pujari has already mentioned about Dr. Baird's lecture, as well as on the on the photon therapy uh, photon therapy from your experience uh, from when you went to Memphis, and uh, yeah. questions for Dr. Baird. Thank you. Well, can you hear me? Yes. I first I'd like to say, Lisa, that's the best talk I've heard on this topic. It was. Very well done. Congratulations. And it's amazing how quickly our knowledge of not just uh, the molecular profiling of these tumors, but of surgical approaches that are safe for these kids is progressing. Um, a couple of points I would make. One is when we see a, a tumor in the, in the ponds in particular, and we're trying to decide whether it's something a DIPG or, or not, I think it's important to consider the clinical condition of the child. We talk about having long track signs plus cranial nerve palsies, but we also talk about having a short clinical history. And occasionally we'll see a child that looks like they have a DIPG on imaging that has a two year history of symptoms or has a normal neurologic exam. And those are typically going to be low-grade tumors, not going to be H3K27 tumors. And um, again, if the uh, clinical course or the radiographic appearance is atypical, then would agree to biopsy. And I also agree that biopsying just for experimental reasons is not appropriate. Um, regarding the, the focused ultrasound, I think the studies that have used it to try to ablate tumor have not been very successful, but I agree with your comment that using focused ultrasound to open the blood-brain barrier has some promise, and uh, we're excited about that. Regarding radiation of DIPGs, I agree completely that photons is appropriate. Uh, I think most centers around the world have stopped giving chemotherapy, particularly if you're in an institution where the family has to pay out of pocket or where resources are scarce and chemotherapy is limited because it makes the kids sick. It steals away their quality of life that 
for the short time they have left. And uh, it's not effective, whereas radiation is effective in helping these kids. So those are my comments. Thank you. And any questions for Dr. Baird, um, Dr. Boop? No, I just think it's a beautiful lecture. I, I hope you'll get it on the listserv where everyone can take advantage of it. Sure, absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. Now we're going to move to uh, Dr. Uh, Suresh Mukherjee. Dr. Mukherjee, um, your questions for Dr. Baird. Thanks. I think uh, I agree uh, with all the comments. It's a beautiful lecture. It's, you know, from a radiology standpoint, um, you know, those of us on the call here, uh, many were probably born in the last century and we trained in the last century. And I remember I was at the Brigham the first time we gave gadolinium for MR. So um, at that time, it was quite fascinating that we could actually see a variety of these tumors. And what's what's happening um, over the last 30 years is that, you know, from an imaging standpoint, we were always able to categorize certain tumors as, you know, pontine gliomas about, you know, we could pretty much determine whether something was benign or or more aggressive. Um, and imaging certainly has changed. And, and you mentioned some of the advances like DTI, uh, et cetera. But, you know, the pathologies even out, the, the pathology has even um, outpaced. Um, sorry, I got somewhere weird. Uh, there we go. <laughs> the pathology changes have actually outpaced the changes in imaging. So some of these uh, tumors that you talked about, especially the pontine tumors and, and others, in general, they were always had a poor prognosis because we would just say that they were pontine gliomas that were associated with poor prognosis. But now based on the pathological changes, sometimes we just can't be um, as certain as we were in the past. And there's no really defining pathognomonic features at times that help us differentiate which are the bad actors and which are not. So I think moving forward, it leaves a bit of a conundrum in the sense if there are targetable mutations that one can see pathologically, and we see these on tumors that have imaging characteristics that we thought were actually more malignant, I think it does leave a bit of a conundrum for actually the need for histologic samples in areas that in the past we would say, well, they may be associated with more um, too much morbidity. So for me, it's been a fascinating journey, and I thought, you know, your presentation was obviously uh, wonderful, um, but it does raise some questions moving forward, especially if you want to try to move the needle on some of these tumors that we, you know, we we never really had much of a prognosis. So those are my comments. Um, my one question to you is that you did mention some some of the things like interoperative MR, but specifically DTI and, if you, uh, and specifically tractography. So I know we have an international audience. Um, and uh, one thing that I've noticed over the last 20 years is that there has been a greater dissemination of technology globally. So when you are looking at tractography and you are making decisions based on whether or not the tumors are infiltrating the tracts, um, most of the vendors right now that um, are making MRIs have, if you will, off the shelf uh, tractography softwares. Now, at Boston Children's Hospital, you know, a lot of the tractography softwares are, like I said, off the shelf. They may not have the, then they're different qualities, I should say. So at Boston Children's, is your tractography in which you're actually making decisions on for surgical resections, um, are these um, refined at Boston Children's in your own grown tractography, or are you using more off the shelf products um, and you feel that those could be uh used um, in a more uh, global setting that may not have the resources that you do in Boston? I, I would say we use both. Um, we we have our kind of preoperative imaging that that is not done in the interoperative MRIs that I, I do think is more refined. Um, and we can integrate that with our navigation systems and start out with that. But we also have um, the ability for our navigation system software to uh, put together the tracks, including on, on new imaging during surgery. And those certainly are less refined. Um, and I, I don't know that, that um, I don't know that the difference there is something we've really been able to tease out, um, but, but I don't find that it's, my impression is it's not quite as detailed as the preoperative, as you say, more refined tracks, the ones that are off the shelf, but they're still, they're still excellent. And it is nice to be able to see shift with those as we're working. Um, and so I, I think that the availability of that with 
the navigation systems where it's integrated um, is helpful. I, I uh, think it's probably just not quite as good as, as all the analysis that's done with the preoperative imaging. I would just comment if you can hear me that uh, any of the any of the metrics that involve uh, adjusting the signal to noise ratio require a radiologist to oversee it. If a technician just does a standard procedure uh, and doesn't window it properly, then we're always misled. So I think that's the critical the critical answer. Um, I will come to that point again um, in terms of the accuracy as well as the neurophysiology, if I may. And I will just move to Dr. Jonathan Chiang. Um, uh, as we said, uh, as already doctors, uh, the, the faculty mentioned that the pathology has changed the game uh, in terms of um, uh, the brainstem gliomas. Um, do you have, first of all, do you have any questions? for Dr. Baird, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the great lecture. Congratulations. Um, I echo Dr. Boop's comment that this is really a great lecture. I I know it's been recorded. I hope it will leave on the YouTube or somewhere forever for all to see. Um, the And I'm also glad that uh, you, you touched upon the, the usefulness of the biopsy and the uh, the molecular studies and the animal models that we can learn from this terrible disease. Um, my one question is related to that, as I am being asked uh, almost daily about that question as well, is for these uh, brainstem tumors, it's in such a delicate area, and we now need more and more tissue for uh, pathology for immunohistochemistry, for NGS, for animal model, for cell culture, for trial eligibility, et cetera, et cetera. How would you decide medically, surgically, and ethically how much tissue to get or even when to biopsy or not? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, and I think one that, that we struggle with as surgeons um, and there's a little bit of nuance to it. I, I think if I'm if I'm in an area where the, the tumor has extended into the peduncle, I'm a little more comfortable taking more tissue. Um, if I have to go a little bit deeper to get to the lesion, I'm a little less comfortable and I may not take as many cores. I think um, I found that four cores, if you get four good cores, you can get everything you need, but you have to be very cautious with like limiting the frozen section, which these are tumors that if you get even a little bit of shift, um, you know, you can miss it if you're being conservative and how deep you go. So I do like to get a little bit of a frozen and make sure I have diagnostic tissue. Um, but you just have to really emphasize to them not to waste anything. They're not getting anything else. Um, if things are going very smoothly, there's no hemodynamic changes. And, and I am... Uh, in an area where I have a little bit more confidence, maybe based on the preoperative imaging or just a more superficial location of your biopsy needle, um, then sometimes I will get up to you know six to eight cores. It's rare for me to do more than that. Um, one, one of the things you do need to do is stay away from the midline. I think biopsying towards the midline is how people get into trouble with these. Um, and I think that can be tempting to do if there's an enhancing nodule and you're thinking, oh, I want to get that higher grade enhancing nodule for good tissue. And you really have to have to um, not do that and, and stay away from the midline to get safe tissue and just really carefully plan your trajectory ahead of time. Um, if you get into any little bit of bleeding as you're getting the cores out of the needle, um, that will usually be a sign that you should stop. Um, and if you get any hemodynamic changes, um, that's also a, a good sign to stop. So it can vary from patient to patient, but I think if you kind of use that approach, you can get enough tissue for all of the molecular diagnostics that are needed. Great. Um, Dr. Uh, Chang, do you have any follow-up questions for Dr. B? Um, no, not at the moment. Thank you. That was a great answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'll come to Dr. Gillian Whitfield. Dr. Whitfield. 
Yeah, I guess the one thing I was thinking about that you could maybe comment on um, at what your feelings are surgically about catheter placement for convection enhanced delivery. It's something that I'm pretty scared of really. And um, I don't know if ultimately it'd be part of the armamentatorium for these tumors, but uh, yeah, the idea of placing catheters in the brainstem is is something that, that scares me a lot. So it'd be interested in your views. Um, it, it definitely can be done. I actually don't think the catheter placement is the biggest concern. It's, it's really getting your agent to perfuse and cover the area that you need it to cover. Um, you know, the, the catheter placements are, are not, these catheters can be smaller than the biopsy needles. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I think we're not, when they're being placed, they're not being placed in, in the deep parts of the brainstem. Um, so I, I think the biggest challenge to me with convection enhanced delivery is more like the perfusion dynamics and the, the molecule that's used and how far it can travel. Um, the actual placement of the catheter, I, I, I think, if, again, just like your biopsy needle, it can be planned and, and done safely. Yeah, thank you. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, in a tumor that metastasizes, I think we need something systemic that, as you say, goes goes further than perhaps can be accessed by the catheters. And it would be very interesting to see how some of the other therapies, immune therapies, CAR-T, et cetera, um, progress. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, while mentioning about metastasis or spread, there's been reports that uh, with the brainstem biopsies, you can get uh, seedlings along the tract. Have uh, any of the surgeons come across that? I don't think that I... Not in brainstem. Yeah. Dr. Bhupnu. Great, thanks. Yeah. Yes. It's a very, very rare complication. That's great. Thanks. So, uh, as I said, it's a continuum in terms of discussions and uh, multidisciplinary um, discussions. So, I'm just going to um, uh, ask um, the first few questions and then I'll, I'll ask the faculty to ask questions to the other members. Um, in terms of the, the low grade, the discrete gliomas, um, is uh, surgery the um, if the patient is symptomatic if, if the patient is not symptomatic uh, would you still operate um, on those patients uh, and if it is if they are symptomatic would is surgery the only uh, solution um, rather than um, chemotherapy or, or or radiotherapy I will start with Dr Baird thanks. Yeah, I think it really just depends on the on the tumor and the patient. Every tumor is unique. Um, if it was an incidentally discovered tumor and they truly are not having any symptoms, I think it's totally reasonable to observe um, and then see how it behaves over time. And if you do see it progress, um, probably in that in, in such a highly eloquent area would want to treat before it did cause symptoms. Um, and then the treatment, whether it was resection or biopsy followed by some other type of adjuvant therapy would really just depend on the anatomy and whether it appeared infiltrative or focal. Um, and if you felt that it was, could be reasonably accessed through one of these safe entry zones. Thanks. Dr. Boop, uh, is, do you have, uh, is, that, is that your same thoughts or do you have anything to add? Thanks. Um, I agree in general. Uh, if the patient is symptomatic from mass effect, debulking the tumor, if you can do it safely, can improve them. Um, back to our discussion about medullary tumors, I think they, the cervical medullary pilocytics can be debulked, but I've not had great success in curing them with surgery alone. They tend to recur over time. And I think it's important to note that when we give low-grade chemotherapy to these tumors, the long-term, oftentimes we'll see a, uh, an early response, particularly in younger children, but the long-term cure of these low-grade gliomas with chemotherapy alone is on the order of 5%, which is about the same amount uh, 
uh, of those children who are treated with low-grade chemotherapy that if they survive long-term will develop le leukemia from the treatment. So we should keep that in mind. Thanks, thank you. Professor Dia Pujari. I mean, uh, I have uh, really, I can't remember seeing uh, a child with a brainstem tumor who's asymptomatic. Uh, so I think it, it does uh, maybe occasionally a midbrain lesion uh, can probably, but to most most tumors are symptomatic. And I think uh, depending on how their accessibility, one would decide about uh, radical excision versus uh, biopsy. Thanks. Uh, in terms of the, the targeted therapies for these low-grade uh, tumors, are they still excision before any consideration? I'm sorry that Dr. Lois, Stephen, Steve Lois, uh, uh, was unable to um, join us. Uh, 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 Dr. Baird, uh, is there any role for the targeted therapies as far as you know in these low-grade tumors? Miraf ones are being, uh, they have started using uh, uh, chemotherapy for these patients if there is a residual or recurrent tumor. But uh, I would like to know, I'm sure there are more experienced people. Thanks. No, I would absolutely agree with that. I think we are using them more and more. And I think the newer generations and, and versions of them are becoming better. I think they are new they're new therapeutics and we're still learning how to use them. Um, you know, I think we're seeing rebound growth when, when patients come off of them sometimes. And so knowing when to, to stop them is challenging. And, um, you know, some of these newer trials that are looking at dual inhibitors um, and whether that will kind of limit the rebound growth when they're, when they're stopped, uh, I think will be, will be interesting to see. Um, I think still standard for for a low grade diagnosis is standard standard low grade chemotherapy and and uh, that tends to be the first line still but that that I think is slowly changing too um, and really just depends on the situation and the patient and I have I have seen more and more patients that go directly to targeted inhibition and kind of skip over the low grade chemotherapy certainly more than than we used to see. Um, if they fail low-grade chemotherapy, though, it's great to have that as a backup option for, for many of these tumors. And I hope for the tumors we don't have targets for yet, namely the FGFRs, um, that we have something very soon. I mean, it, it really is nice to have that backup for a lot of the, uh, the other alternatives. Can I, can I just add that I think we're still at a stage where if pe patients are being treated with targeted agents like these, they need to be on a, a study. Um, I agree. Some two thirds of the kids that get the BRAF inhibitors will have grade three toxicities, and sometimes those can be quite debilitating. And oftentimes they have to stop the medication because of that. And then you have the issue of regrowth. Um, so, I, and and the other is that some of these drugs cost twenty thousand dollars a month. So if they're not on a study, who's going to pay for that? Um, so a lot of promise, but we're early yet. Yeah, oh, very good points. Thank you, Dr. Whittle. Um, yeah, and Dr. Whitfield, uh, I think uh, you have to don both both the caps, new oncologist and radiation oncologist today. for. Yeah, us. yeah. Um, I, I don't give the drugs for pediatric oncology patients, but obviously I work closely with my ped pediatric oncology colleagues who do. So... Um, I mean, I think, you know, the good thing about having a biopsy is it makes potentially accessible for targeted agents as well as more conventional chemo. I think for me, the interesting thing is also, you know, at what point do you think about irradiating? So a lot of these tumours are not completely operable. And then in certainly in the youngest children and younger children, um, we would tend to favour systemic treatment first. And that's partly because although it might not ultimately be curative or it might not ultimately control the tumor long term, it does have um, avoids the risk of 
you know, radiation induced malignancy at that time. And some of the risks are lower in younger children. So probably risk of radiation induced malignancy is higher. Risk of vascular effects is higher in younger children, um, stroke, etc. So for that reason, even if ultimately systemic options are perhaps not going to be the long term answer, it can delay significantly the need to give radiation. And when we irradiate the brainstem, depending you know, on the position of the tumor in the brainstem, there may be some dose to other relevant structures like the cochleas. Um, there may even be hippocampal dose, even with proton therapy. So again, those um, are often advantageous to delay. But equally, we see children where perhaps there's been too much effort to delay radiation. They've had progressive tumor, they've got progressive symptoms. And then at the time of radiation, you're not going to reverse all of that. And in fact, if they're quite symptomatic, then any treatment related edema, which often does happen with low grade tumors, can become quite problematic and symptomatic. And then you can be in the territory of, you know, treatments to deal with that, those radiation related changes. So, so it is difficult. It's desirable, I think, to delay the radiation, but not to delay it too long if the tumor is, is becoming progressive in difficult areas and a child is at risk of becoming more symptomatic or becoming more symptomatic. It's a difficult balance. Don't think there's a simple answer. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, if we, I think one of the questions in terms of biopsy, you mentioned Dr. Baird that biopsying in the middle of the tumor, even if there's a contrast rim, it's not wise. Is there any other uh, tricks and tips that you use uh, to avoid bleeding complication uh, of uh, these tumors or any other complication? Any, any tips and tricks for biopsying? And also, this uh, whether you do all the biopsies with frame-based uh, stereotactic um, system or for the large DIPGs, do you use uh, frameless ones? Thanks. Um, yeah, no, good, good question. And, and, uh, I generally, as I mentioned, try to stay a little more laterally. I think it's also the less vascular part of the tumor. If you're closer to the peduncle, um, and so typically you can avoid getting into significant bleeding. Uh, if you are, if you are at, um, an area where there is some enhancement, um, or even like a necrotic a necrotic area, I'll try to stay kind of on the edge of that, of that enhancement instead of getting too deep into the necrotic area. Um, and then as far as, you know, avoiding the eloquent tracks, I'll try to kind of aim my target to be a little bit superior um, from where I think the, the seven um, fibers are passing. Um, I, I, we use both brain lab and stealth here and, and a frameless navigation. Um, and I find them to be quite accurate. So um, that's, that's typically what we use. And thank frameless you. Frameless systems also allow you to use navigation during the, uh, sorry, the DTI images during the procedure. Uh, yeah, we can navigate off of the DTI images. Yes. Uh, you mentioned about the, uh, pre-op planning in terms of biopsy, uh, like the the functional neuroscience and the epilepsy neuroscience, you, you pre-operatively plan to avoid the blood vessels uh, um, uh, or does it need to be that uh, detailed planning? Yeah, the, um, as far as the blood, the blood vessels, um, most TIPG biopsies thankfully do not bleed very much. I, I think if it was a very aggressive DIPG at the time of presentation. Um, it might be more prone to bleed and, and you may get into a little bleeding with your first or second core and, and then I would, I would kind of back away. But thankfully most of them are not um, vascular at the time of presentation. What, one thing I will say is I do like to biopsy them before radiation. I think it's safer. And uh, kind of your, your tumor to neuron um, astrocyte ratio is going to be higher before they've gone into radiation. And so um, doing, doing it at the time of presentation is probably a safer time to biopsy. It certainly can be done later, um, 
but they're likely more likely to bleed once the tumor is a little bit more advanced or recurrent than they are up front. Um, Thank you. Come to Dr. Jason Chang. Um, you know, in the old days, or you know, in the days that, as far as I know, that biopsies sometimes in a DIPG might come as a low grade, and and those confusions has that confusions gone since the molecular analysis have started, or do you still have the same problems? Thanks. Um, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, even the radiographically typical DIPGs. Um, we do see a certain pro pro proportion of low-grade gliomas, um, especially tumors without H3, K27M mutation. And we see signature molecular alterations of low-grade gliomas, such as MIB alteration, BRAF alteration, and FGF alteration. Um, with, the, with the new molecular findings, um, I think we actually learn way more about the biology of the tumors and we can start to better refine the treatment. For example, the histology of DIPG, the classic DIPG, uh, now they are called diffuse midline glioma. The histology can actually range from grade one to grade four. So if, if you are facing a, a mitotically active vascular polyvision, necrotic high-grade tumors, then people will agree that's a high-grade glioma, no question. But if the tumor is diffusely infiltrating, but mitotic activity hard to find, uh, whether that's a low grade diffuse glioma or that's a diffuse midline glioma, just that we don't get the high grade bit or we catch it early enough that it's not high grade yet. Um, doing the molecular study is really, really helpful and to put the tumors in the correct bucket. Um, so we, we can now start to learn whether the low-grade histology of diffuse midline glioma with K27M mutation, do they actually perform better than the outright high-grade diffuse midline glioma with K27M mutation? And we can correctly separate them from other low-grade gliomas with diffuse histology, for example, MIB low-grade glioma. Uh, they tend to have good histology and they may be inseparable from typical DIPGs by radiology. And when we get into the, the tumors that show clinical symptoms and imaging features deviate from the typical DIPGs, the so-called atypical DIPGs, um, then based on our institutional cohort, probably only half or less than half of them are actually H3K27M mutant uh, diffuse mean like glioma. Then uh, as Dr. Brett uh, Baird mentioned um, the biopsy is really critical for us to understand that. So with the new understanding, especially the molecular aspect, I think we are start to getting into the the chance, the opportunity of improving the outcome of these terrible brainstem hypergliomas. Thanks, thank you. And just uh, last question from me before I ask for the faculty to ask questions at each other. Um, in terms of a practical question, uh, hydrocephalus with brainstem uh, tumors uh, is the first uh, option is the endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Have you ever done a shunt and then there's been metastasis in the peritoneum? I'll start with Dr. Beard. Thank you. Um, I, I tried to avoid shunts at all costs. Uh, so I will always try an endoscopic third ventriculostomy first. Um, and even in some cases, if it's a very expansile tumor and the prepontine cistern is effaced, you can sometimes still do a lamina terminalis ETV that will work. Um, so I, I do think avoiding shunts, if at all possible, is, is best for all tumors, but especially for um, DIPGs. I mean, you just do not want to be dealing with kind of shunt issues um, in that setting. Um, I have never seen metastatic spread from a high-grade glioma. Um, I, I have seen it from neuroembryonal tumors, uh, but not from high-grade glioma and certainly not from, you know, our typical brainstem tumors. Thanks. And when you mentioned uh, about lamina terminalis uh, ETV, uh, is it the open one or do you do it endoscopically with a flexible endoscope? Uh, endoscopically with a flexible endoscope. Thanks. And the same question to Prof. Uh, Dear Pujari. Uh, 
um, obviously, obviously, you are again very endoscopy. I have got your book. I'm still studying it. Uh, um, I'll review it. Thanks. Uh, your thoughts are in hydrocephalus in these patients, thanks. Fortunately, with DIPGs, hydrocephalus is not uh, so common and uh, very, very rarely you need to do it. But uh, as uh, Lisa just said, I think the ones which are dorsally exophytic, when you see the tumor going all around the basilar, I am a little worried about those cases to try a third ventriculostomy in the prepontine space. Uh, but I think uh, in others it is possible and we've actually tried to uh, do a lamina terminalis uh, even with rigid scope, with uh, paired scopes it is possible. Of course, in midbrain tumors it is much more common and you need to do it much more often probably and we always do it before we actually go for the tumor surgery. Thank you. Um, that's great. So, um, Dr. Baird, I just want you to, I think, you know, it's good to have uh, our Dr. Dr. Whitfield and Dr. Mukherjee and Dr. Chiang from other specialties here and it's a large audience here. What questions do you would you like to ask Dr. Chiang from a neuropathology point of view? Thanks. Um, well, I, I think, you know, the neuropathology is so critical to us. I mean, do you, do you see that the diagnostic um, criteria changing further for for these tumors with, with each iteration of kind of the WHO guidelines? We seem to be becoming more and more molecular um, as we move along. And, and where do you see that kind of going next with with maybe methylation and influenced diagnostics and, and so forth? Yeah, very great question. Yes, um, molecular is getting more and more important. Um, and it's only because we did not know these tumors enough. And as every aspect of human life, uh, the more dimension we know, um, and hopefully the better we can treat those tumors. And But the, the more we know, then it will raise even more and more questions. For example, um, we start to know K27 mutations showing up in other non-diffuse midline gliomas. Uh, in cerebral cortical tumors, rarely in other sites, and sometimes with unusual combinations, for example, BRAF and FGFR1. Do they still behave similarly to the classic, typical DIPG diffused midline glioma? I think we still need to learn from that. And also, for example, the, the most classic example would be uh, BRAF B600 mutation. They can be, we can see that in pyrocytic astrocytoma, we can see that in hybrid glioma, glioblastoma, we can see that in colorectal cancer, metastatic melanoma. So just one molecular mutation is not enough to define the disease. Um, I think the next iteration of, of the WHO will have, we will have way more molecular information. We will have way more methylation and other advanced uh, molecular uh, diagnostics to be merged into the diagnostic criteria. But I think the bottom line is still the same. Um, we see the patients. We need to know the implication of that. We need to know the clinical implication, the treatment implication of that. I think we all are still learning from, from that. And the WHO is meant for making a diagnosis. And things is just starting once we have the diagnosis. So we still need to know the treatment aspect, the care, the prognosis. Um, so we are still learning. And also we, we need to be mindful of the impact of all the advanced molecular analysis because we now have an international audience there. Um, I see that the world is still having problems trying to catch up with all the advanced molecular studies. So, the, the question I have here for all you all of you here is, given the diverse availability of technology and resources we have, how has the new WHO impact your practice and how we all are going to face and resolve, hopefully we can resolve that issue. I think that that's a question that we need, we all need to think about. And I'm here, I hope, 
I can learn from some of your insights. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Baird, do you have any follow up? Yes, yeah, cer certainly the clinical practice lags behind um, and lags far behind. And I, I think, you know, a good example is the attempts to dose reduce radiation for some of the medulloblastoma subtypes. Um, and uh, how, how that, I, I, I mean, I, I'm probably not the right one to ask for the details of that, but I don't think that was quite as um, successful as, as we hoped. And, and I think we, we kind of don't know yet what to do with, with some of the, the new information. Um, you know, we can, we can correlate it to prognosis sometimes even, so it, it, it does help with, with uh, counseling patients but to change the standard of care requires going through clinical trials and, and we lag far, far behind um, in, that, in that sense. Thank you. Dr. Mukherjee, can I, you, uh, uh, in terms of you mentioned about uh, radiology and how neuropathology has kind of uh, now doing the running as if it were, is there any technology that neuroradiology is going to bring that's going to bring back diagnosed radio uh, diagnosed imaging diagnosis and in terms of correlating this molecular pathology to radiology uh, these are very rare tumors is this going to happen thanks and your question no, that's a great question yeah, yeah no thanks for the opportunity i think just one point i wanted to make is because we have a pretty diverse audience uh, a global audience which is why i always enjoy participating in this so naren thanks for for all you do you really you really make the world a smaller place. Um, and I think you really, you know, help so many people by what you've done over the last 30 years. So, you know, thank you for, for all you do and thank you for allowing us to participate. Um, the reason I made that comment also is that by the time a, a tumor gets into, excuse me, a tertiary or quaternary center, it's pretty much assumed that it is a, a, a tumor. And I'm specifically talking about um, brainstem gliomas. Um, but I do want to uh, make the point that I know in my, I guess I'm old enough to say I have experience now. I hate to say that it means I'm old, but I know at times we've seen incredible responses from what were believed to be brainstem gliomas after they were treated with radiation therapy. I mean, complete resolution. And I think a certain proportion of these tumors may have been mimicking other disorders and specifically inflammatory disorders. So I do want to emphasize the fact that there are some mimics of uh, brainstem gliomas that the neurosurgeons, um, radiation oncologists, and radiologists need to be aware of. And I know this was sort of described back in the early 90s, things like rhomboencephalitis due to listeria and other types of encephalitis can initially have imaging findings that do mimic a brainstem glioma. So I just want to uh, caution everyone and make sure people are aware of that, that not every um, expansile lesion in the pons is necessary glioma, that you do have various inflammatory um, causes that need to be worked up um, medically before we um, give that child and especially the parents is this, this terrible diagnosis. Um, moving forward, um, for me, it's almost like a horse race in the sense that in the old days, it was, you know, patients would present with these lesions before imaging, then imaging came along and we were able to characterize this. And then pathology came along and, you know, we could say that it was probably high grade or low grade with the understanding that there was a lot of heterogeneity. So I know there was a lot of sampling errors. We would say, we, you know, we as radiologists would say, well, it's got to be a, a low grade lesion, but then we would take these samples and they say it was high grade and um, and that part of it is just inherent to any, you know, tumor that we have. I think the one thing moving forward, as was was mentioned previously, is maybe looking at the moleculars will allow us a little bit more confidence that the samples that we're getting are actually truly representative of the tumors as a whole. So my hope is that going from heterogeneity to more consistent diagnosis with help. You know, where are we going right now? What I mean by the horse race is that every five years, the WHO sort of upgrades um, new diagnosis. So when I looked at the 2001, you know, we have things like methylation and IDH wild type for gliomas, but there's also secondary um, various moleculars that are felt to be um, 
consistent with, although not diagnostic. So from our standpoint as radiologists, you know, we want to be able to look at these, but the pathologists are always, the, the moleculars are always changing now. But right now, when we look at the new techniques, um, there are various things like radiomics. There are things like perfusion and diffusion weighted imaging, and certainly with artificial intelligence, et cetera. And there's a whole cadre of these molecular imaging techniques um, that are being investigated. Um, and I'm sure if you look in any of the literature, you'll see this, you know, whether it's in neurosurgery, the radiology literature, um, pathology literature, et cetera. The challenge is, is that, you know, is the data enough to actually make decisions based on what we're finding? And from my standpoint right now, I, I'm not sure if we're necessarily there, but there's never been a shortage of new technologies and new statistical um, um um, uh, new statistical um, markers that may be more predictive. It's just hard to say, but there's a lot out there. I just don't know if if the information that we're getting is actually going to be enough to to make treatment decisions um, for these very for these various tumors. Thank you, Doctor uh, Chang. Do you have any comments on what Doctor um, Mukherjee mentioned about? How you guys move the goalpost rightly so every five years i used to love buying neuropathology books even if i didn't study them but they have stopped publishing them because they had enough of being outdated by the time they have published thanks yeah those are um, very, very good points um i think we need to be mindful that we don't move the diagnostic criteria and the, the name of the disease too fast otherwise the, the patient care won't be able to catch up and the studies won't be able to catch up. Um, one example is that um, we, we started a, a infant high-grade glioma study back in 2007. And, and by the time we, we finalized the result, uh, we tried to summarize the pathology and the clinical outcome, um, it's 2021. So it, it spans three versions of the, of the WHO. Uh, we have to re-review the histology. We have to redo many of the molecular analysis. We have to amend the IRB because many of the molecular analysis, for example, RNA sequencing, whole genome parison sequencing and methylation did not exist back in 2007. And we have to redo all that uh, to get all the blocks from all over the world to summarize the study and, and to to correlate the molecular finding with the clinical outcome. So it takes us 17 years to publish a study that we started in, in 2007. So the, the, the real impact on patient care is really, really slow. So moving the goalpost too fast is not benefit uh, for, it's not beneficial for every, everyone, especially in, in income and resources limited countries. Um, so I, I think I I'm also aware of that. So the clinical impact of that. So I, I think the the pathology society, the especially the new pathology society, um, there have there has been there have been multiple discussions about how to balance the multiple defenses versus the diagnostic and patient care aspect of this. So. I think uh, the, the feedback from people around the world, uh, especially from the resources limited countries, because most of the kids with brain tumors are actually not in the resourceful areas. And the the, the sad full truth that the, the most significant uh, prognostic factor for pediatric brain tumor is not actually what tumors you get, but where you live, what cares you can get. So. Um, we need to remember that as we move forward. Thank you. And Aaron, can I just ask a follow-up question? Real quick. Um, so Dr. Chang, maybe you can um, give me a, a look into Pandora's box here in the sense that mm -hmm. when I look at the, the WHO classification, I see these numerous every five years things are changed. Can you give me a little bit of insight as to what threshold needs to be um, achieved before a certain molecular marker is deemed to be diagnostic of a specific tumors. Because when I looked at it, it's almost like a Maslow's hierarchy. You have the primary ones here that have now accepted, but you have a bunch of smaller ones that are sort of waiting in the wings. 
And then you have ones that have this loose association. So from my standpoint, is there something that um, triggers or says, yes, this is now made it to the a true diagnostic cri criteria? Um, very good question. I don't think there is a defined uh, criteria what gets into the WHO or what not. Um, there are multiple work, working groups on various aspects of the WHO work. For example, uh, methylation yeah. analysis, local glioma working yeah. group, yeah. high glioma working group, etc. Right. And people would discuss what we have in terms of how to define the disease, how to uh, what's the impact on clinical outcome, patient outcome? Um, for example, a professional entity called DGUNK, it can only be diagnosed by DNA methylation, and the histology can range from low grade to high grade. Therefore, we cannot define the molecular, we cannot define the WHO grade of that, and we don't know the clinical impact of that because it's such a rare entity. So it is still a professional tumor type in the WHO, it's not the official diagnosis. We still need to learn about that. And the other extreme is the IDH mutant adult type glioma. Now, there are so many studies of them. They are relatively common. So we know uh, how we can find define them better molecularly, for example, IDH mutation uh, and the significance of CDK and 2 a mosaicus deletion on the impact of prognosis. So that gets gets into the WHO. So that will be uh, better uh, because we have a better understanding of that. Same thing for adult type uh, glioblastoma. Now we, need, now we know that we do not necessarily need mitotic activity, vascular proliferation, necrosis to make a diagnosis of glioblastoma. If the tumor has a certain molecular signature, for example, gain of seven, loss of 10, um, etc. Then we make we can make a diagnosis of molecular glioblastoma. So the periodic reviewing of all the evidence is essential, and the WHO is always a work in progress. Um, it's not perfect. We can always find problems in that. The intrinsic limitation is that it has to be written at one fixed point, and we have to review evidence to write that. So it almost by default that once it is written and published, it will be outdated because the the wheel is keep moving forward and it's a fixed product in that time. So we need to have the understanding of that. And and as as you mentioned, um we as we accumulate the knowledge, we keep learning and we keep finding exceptions and Hopefully, in the end, uh, after decades or so, we can implement that for the actual patient care. Thanks. Thank you. Professor Diapujari, can I come to you? Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to ask about the more benign variety of tumor, the pilocytic tumor. If you have either a BRAF uh, fusion or mutation, though it doesn't make it, uh, uh, you know, grade 2 or any higher grade tumor, would you treat it differently in terms of follow-up or in terms of uh, uh, how how you uh, treat them uh, after uh, radical resection? Lisa, as well as Dr. Chang, can probably tell us if they should be looked out looked at differently. Dr. Whitfield. Uh, yeah, um, I, don't, I don't think that the molecular diagnostics change our surveillance patterns um, with low-grade gliomas. Uh, they may they may raise our suspicions with certain with certain types, but kind of the interval of surveillance imaging really is the same across the board still. Rubitfield, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I guess um, it depends. You know, the interval probably for us would start the same with most children after initial diagnosis being imaged three monthly. But um, if you have, say, a pilocytic astrocytoma that you manage to completely resect, albeit that would be unusual in the brain stem, um, unless it's mainly exophytic, you know, over time, then the surveillance pattern would adjust to, to what you've observed. And also, you know, if you intervene with, with chemotherapy or targeted therapy, then they would return to three-monthly surveillance for us. 
Um, but once off treatment, if you observe a pattern of stability, it might space out of it. So, yeah, I think it, it starts the same, but informed by what you observe. So can I just ask a question? What if we as a radiologist uh, find something that looks like an MVNT? So what is the consensus regarding imaging follow-up for something that characteristically looks like MVNT? What do you mean by MVNT? Not many people, including me, don't know. So. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Multinodular vaculating uh, neuronal tumors. Sort of a, a it's a, it's still felt to be a, a, a low-grade glioma, but in general, um, they don't grow. Um, and it typically presents with seizures. And uh, I know that can be a conundrum uh, once we as radiologists, you know, suggest that diagnosis. We don't see them in brain stem. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean not at brain stem, but outside the brain stem. Yeah, we, we would watch the behavior for a period and 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 then let that inform surveillance and spread it out over time if, if there was stability. Thank you. And usually surgery would be for probably seizure rather than the tumor itself, if that is a presentation. Thanks. So, dear Pujari and um, uh, Dr. Baird, in terms of um, and uh, in ter have you come across in terms of the what Dr. Suresh Mukherjee mentioned about the mimics? Um, in Indian setting, uh, mimics might be different from uh, Western setting, or not? Are they the same, Prof? The most common uh, in children, what we see is uh, the tuberculous uh, pathology, but I think. Uh, the diffusion weighted imaging and uh, spectroscopy has made a made it much easier for us to diagnose it. So wherever uh, good MR uh, facilities are available, I think it has become much less to. And uh, if we do find that there is a definite uh, T2 hypo intensity, you find uh, you know uh, the lipid lactate peak, and if you find uh, a reasonably localized lesion, you would treat them medically for six weeks and usually you can see a good response. Imaging at three months confirms that it has probably been and I have personally treated about a dozen of these. So it's it's not very uncommon, but that's the only other pathology that I have seen, especially in children. Thanks. Dr. Baird, have you come across uh, these mimics that had caused confusion and then found to be a neurological condition? Yeah, I, I think the most likely mimics that we would see would be neuroinflammatory lesions, whether um, neuroimmunologic or post-infectious T2 changes. Um, if it was a non-symptomatic case, we would certainly observe. And if there was stability, we, we would not proceed with any, any biopsy. Um, but if there were symptoms and they persisted and there was any concern for neoplasia over time with growth, then we would probably want tissue. Thanks. I was listening to uh, Professor Eric Buffet's talk, uh, at least the way I understood it is uh, that in terms of taking biopsies from the DIPGs, uh, in, in he, you know, he, my impression was that he didn't much change the management um, in in terms of the numbers, is is that the same feeling for you? Does the taking the biopsy actually change uh, management in what percentage of patients would you say that? Well, I th I think if you, if you look at the atypical DIP DIPG radiographic DIPG, um, it's up to thirty percent of them will not actually be DMG. So certainly that would change the management if you uncovered a, a different type of tumor. If it was a neuroembryonal tumor they would go into potentially debulking and different, very different chemotherapy um, management. So capturing those um, truly non-DMG patients um, will dramatically change things. I think that's the minority. Um, for the ones that, that are confirmed to be DMG, um, it mainly changes things if they have a a um, dual driver that you are able to augment their therapy and, and there's there's really no supportive um, clinical data to, 
to say that's going to improve outcome, but it does maybe give you some other treatment options. Um, but the main thing is it will um, make them eligible for clinical trials. And not all clinical trials require tissue, but many do. And so if they want to be eligible for those trials, um, then they do need to have the biopsy. And, and they don't, you know, I think we kind of don't know in the in the lifetime of a patient with this with this um, diagnosis, what trials are going to open, um, and so it's one reason we do tend to get them up front when we feel it's safer to biopsy, and then we have the information, and then moving forward um, in the setting of recurrence, there are certain trials that are, that are then eligible for without having to revert to surgery. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Whitfield. I think I would also say that. Um, even if it doesn't change the management, when you see one of these patients, it's obviously completely devastating for the parents with, with the H3K27 mutant brainstem glioma. And I think in the past, when they weren't biopsied, you know, parents were aware that the percentage of children who survived longer term, these were probably the ones who didn't have that biology. Um, I think it helps the parents to have greater certainty what they're dealing with and to prepare for the awful situation they're in. And yes, in time, hopefully it will, it will make, you know, better treatment options available. But even without that, I think just the certainty of knowing what you're dealing with is, is very, very helpful. That's a same important ethical point as well, isn't it? The other side of the ethics. Uh, Professor Tia in terms of the finances of all these uh, fancy or you know all these uh, detailed elaborate neuropathological tests um uh, i know that you are from an exclusive practice have an exclusive practice but in general is is this uh, uh wh how how does the how has the management of the uh, uh, diffuse uh, um contain gliomas changed in, in the developing world from what you have seen in the rest of India or in, in, your, in your extensive travels over? In our own practice, I think uh, it has changed a great deal with uh, better MR imaging. I think if I, have a tube, if I have a patient who has a longer history, anything more than six months or, or in fact even a year, if somebody does not have bilateral signs, if the involvement of the brainstem is less than 50%, if you have heterogeneous enhancement, these are some of the criteria we'll use to decide to do biopsy or not. Of course, a focal lesion is treated quite uh, regularly by surgery. There are uh, fortunately several people who are now regularly uh, doing brainstem surgery even in India. Uh, so I think we, we try to differentiate between typical and atypical DIPGs when we decide to do biopsies or not. But what looks like a frank DIPG, if you have more than 50% involvement of the brainstem, homogeneous lesion, short history. We are not uh, uh, doing biopsies in those patients. Okay, thanks. Dr. Uh, Baird, is there any exclusion that you don't do biopsies in um, in your practice? C certainly. I mean, it's it's always an option. And, and um, I, I would, again, reiterate, we don't biopsy every single patient. It's the vast majority. But there are patients that will elect not to have biopsy, and we always offer the standard of care radiation up front without biopsy. So certainly this is um, part of the conversation when they come in and, and have the imaging findings. Um, and we, I think, do our best to present kind of a balanced um, picture of what the pros and cons are um, and what the safety data is. But um, it's optional. It's certainly optional. Thanks. Dr. Chang, in terms of all the all the tests that you do on a DIPG biopsy in St. Jude's, do you know how much is the is the is the price of the all the tests come to in the order of what order? Uh, that that's a very good question, actually. Um all the tests that we do uh, for DIPGs, if we can get um six to eight cores, as Dr. Uh, mentioned um we we do histological diagnosis immunohistochemistry we do whole genome whole exome RNA sequencing methylation we create cell lines and xenograft if feasible um so that that's all the spectrum that we do for DIPG patients we really try our best to get every bit detail so that the patient can be fit onto existing clinical trials and we 
maybe we can do pre preclinical studies to support future clinical trial um, uh, design and implementation. Um, that being said, um, Senju is a very special practice. We we don't charge the patient for even a penny. So um, I, I'm not the right person to ask about the cost, although I know the cost vary quite a bit from from zero as in due to thousands of dollars, US dollars um, in other places. So that indeed is a constraint. And we often do that as a service for our neuro, neuro um the, the brain tumor patients because we, we we try to alleviate the cost aspect of the diagnosis for their tumors. Thanks. Dr. Mukherjee, I know that you feel strongly about this and uh... In, in, in very rich countries, it might be possible. But I know that in India, you know, many families will, many family, families will empty their life savings and coffers to get that one test if, in case, as every parent would. Do you have any thoughts? Thanks. Yeah, just, yeah, I have a few thoughts on this. I think, you know, first of all, you know, with the global audience, um, and this is where I was sort of asked Dr. Chang um, about the moleculars is, a lot of the molecular diagnoses that would be made at St. Jude's or at Boston Children's or or in the UK um, may not be made elsewhere because there's a certain amount of tissue and a certain amount of sequencing that needs to be done. It's more than H&E staining. It's more than immunohistochemical staining. It's actually NGS sequencing. And some of the NGS sequencing yeah. may not be available at certain centers. So then the second thing is that if you actually do the NGS sequencing and you do pay the cost for this, um, is it really going to affect your treatment? I know in the United States and adults, you know, we'll end up doing the biopsies, we'll be end, end up doing 500 biomarkers, but for GBMs, everyone gets treated with temozolomide and radiation therapy, the majority of it. So the issue is you do all the molecular testing, you sort of empty out the coffers. In the United States, the average family of four end up making $70,000, and that's before taxes, that's before they have to put food on their table, so on and so forth. So we'd get the sequencing, but is it really making a difference in the upfront treatment? People will say, well, you know, if, if they recur, then we've already molecularly characterized that tumor. But in actuality, we all know that radiation and chemo can induce various mutations. So the molecular signature that we have pre-treatment may not actually be accurate after treatment. The third thing, and I'll just end, end there, is that in the United States right now, because of the politicians and the various states are understanding the importance of biomarker testing, numerous states right now in the United States are now mandating that insurance companies actually pay for biomarker testing. So it doesn't mean they're going to pay for everything, but a su substantial amount will be paid for. Where I'm going with this is that if you do do biomarker testing and you are doing NGS sequencing, there are certain places like St. Jude's, like Boston Children's, like in, in Mumbai, like in, in, in the UK, where you, the testing is very good and it's very accurate. But as we know, there are going to be new laboratories that are developing. And currently, there's no way to ensure that the biomarker testing from sl s smaller laboratories is indeed accurate. So we run the risk in the future of actually making diagnosis based on biomarker testing, they may not be accurate. And then if you take it to the next level, some of these targeted therapies that are going to be based on specific mutations may not be accurate as well, too. So as we sort of go into these new areas, I think these are all questions that we need to consider because they are going to affect not only diagnosis, the outcomes, but also um, the financial resources of, of our, our society. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Um, it's all coming to neuropathology. <laughs> um, so, do you, do you think at the moment, it, uh, no, can, I'll, I'll, you, you heard what Dr. Mukherjee said, your, your response then? Yeah, that's a, that's a good, uh, very good and valid point. Um, as in you, we, we also see lots of patients from low middle income countries where they have limited access to targeted therapy and even a, a clinical trial protocol for uh, relatively straightforward disease, uh, relatively such as low grade glioma. Um, so the the our approach, or at least my approach, is always to see what the practice setting they they have, um, and what 
they actually need for treat the patient. For example, if they only need histologic diagnosis, then I'll issue my report just based on histology. We will still do all the molecular studies as standard of care, but those will be supplementary. Those won't delay my diagnosis. Um, so I can turn out, turn around the diagnosis as quickly as possible, sometimes within 24 hours, and let the molecular analysis drag on for weeks, um, which is understandably used for research for future studies, not for patient care. And for places where they can find eligible trials for the patient, then we geared uh, towards specific analysis. For example, if there's a a study for uh, B7H3 CAR T, then we do B7H3 immunohistochemistry chemistry to, to know, to see if the patient is eligible or not. If there is a trial for MAPK inhibitor, uh, different versions of MAPK inhibitor, then we do NGS, we do FISH, we do uh, analysis based on the tumor type to find the alteration so that the patient can be fit onto the trial. If there's a trial for BRAF B600E, then we can do a simple IHC or targeted sequencing. So the approach will be will be variable. Um, and yes, the, the impact of all the advanced decode molecule analysis on the patient care, the actual outcome is limited. Um, but I, as a brain tumor researcher, I always have the hope in the future and and I think we also need to understand clearly that there is a separate world from research and patient care. Uh, as Dr. Boo mentioned, uh, we don't want to try to achieve research goals by harming or even impacting actual patient care. I think those are the, the valid points that we need to consider in the current molecular world. Thank you. This last last two questions. One is the last, very last one is for Dr. Baer on the chat box. But as you send, mentioned, Dr. Professor Dio Pujari, there are people offering surgeries or some experimental studies in states, as well as I'm sure in India, there will be more than, uh, there will be more and more. How are you dealing with those uh, how, in terms of educating patients? Or how do you deal with that dilemma of these, um, these uh, uh, you know, uh, um, these physicians who are giving what we might think unrealistic expectations to families, thanks. Oh, I I don't think there is a, a study going on DIPGs in India at the moment. Uh, most people are uh, uh, sort of uh, basic, based on radiological interpretation, it is happening. Uh, there is uh, uh, some data being collected from Nimhans, uh, pathology group from uh, biopsies done at various centers, which should be available soon. But currently, I don't have any data to talk about. Our decisions to do the biopsy, as I told you, uh, are based on what we think about the tumor. And when you put it to the patient uh, that biopsy might help, most people agree. Uh, uh, I mean, there are some dropouts, but uh, uh, most people agree to have a biopsy done. Uh, so it's it's uh, getting an accepted uh, uh, kind of a mode of treatment or investigation, uh, but I think very few centers are doing it. Thanks, thank you, Doctor Beda. Uh, I uh, when I was listening to uh, Doctor Eric Buffet's talk, uh, he mentioned that a couple of centers in America, Neuroleptics and others, I think. Uh, they advertise that they have got some breakthrough medica medic treatment that uh, patients should go. And obviously, the parents are so anxious. Do you have those? Uh, many, I think they are mainly in the West Coast, but does that affect you? Do you get patients asking those questions as well? Or is it usually the oncologist it goes to? Um, yeah, I mean, pa patients will we'll get on social media together and find all sorts of alternative care therapies. Um, I, and I think, I think most patients that, that, um, that are, are looking around are educating themselves about the tumor and, and really can tell the difference between what is 
what is uh, maybe alternative care and what is standard of care. Um, and we certainly try to help guide them. Um, and, and strongly advise if it's a situation where we think that they are going to be wasting financial resources for their family. Um, you can't always deter them. Um, but I, I think I think many things are harmless and I think many things are harmful and you try to do your best to guide them. I mean, we have, we have many patients that go on um, CBD, THC kind of combinations for, that that are not being recommended through the oncologists. And we have many patients who do, you know, hyperbaric oxygen therapy and, and there's all sorts of, of things like that um, that go around. And, you know, you, you do your best to kind of inform them of what the data is and what the difference between an anecdotal kind of report of, of benefit um, uh, and, and available literature is. And we also don't know everything. so. So uh, yeah, and that definitely happens. And um, I think we just do our best to give them the most information possible to make an informed decision. Um, and, and I will just back up and say a little bit that the molecular information is absolutely informing clinical care and, and is very, very important to us. Um, we probably do get more than is needed, um, but but there is there is a very important part of it that that really has entered clinical practice routinely. And, and we, do, we do need it for, for decision-making, um, I think, in this era. And maybe not so much for DIPGs, but for many of the other tumors, it, it can be very critical. Thanks, thank you. Dr. Whitfield, uh, do, you, do you have, you know, we had that, uh, uh, that case about five or six years ago in Southampton um, about the family wanting proton beam therapy and taking the kid over. That was for, that was for, uh, I think, a pendymoma or maybe, uh, uh, that's not a brainstem tumor. But do you get families argue, uh, asking for proton beam rather than radiotherapy? Do you have those dilemmas? Um, to a certain extent, I think it has become less. So we've had proton therapy actually in the UK and delivery in the UK for five years prior to that. From about 2008, we sent families overseas. So we do get a small number of families with children with, you know, incurable poor prognosis conditions asking about proton therapy. But they usually respond to, you know, you explaining because it is very available and they know that the vast majority of children are getting proton therapy. I find that they're usually more receptive if you explain why it's not going to help in their case. So I would say now it's more available. It's probably less contentious. That's great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Dr. Baird, there's a question for you in the chat box. Uh, it was about uh, microscope versus ex exoscopes for surgery for in the brainstem. Uh, do, you, do you have thoughts on that? Um, thanks. Um, I, I, it's a great question, and certainly some people have completely moved over to exoscopes. Um, I've, I've tried exoscopes. I, I think I've probably um, gotten to a point where my motor memory just does not work well with exoscopes. I, I can see the advantage, and I think if you learn how to do these cases with an exoscope, um, there are absolute advantages, but when you haven't been using them, it, it can be a challenging um, transition to make just from the ergonomics of how you do your cases and the muscle memory and things like that. Um, it's a great tool. It's a great tool for observers in the room. Um, and it's a great tool to kind of expand your field of visibility and focus. And um, I, I do see the advantage and I, I think they probably will become more and more commonplace. Um, but they're, they're one tool of many that we use in the operating room. I think we use endoscopes more just to look around corners um, and, and that will probably continue. And so I, th I think um, all of the things that enhance our ability to see um, will, will probably continue to evolve to some degree, but exoscopes have their place and uh, will probably become more commonplace in the neurosurgical OR, but, but uh, yeah. I think it's going to be a harder thing for the the older surgeons um, to switch. Thanks, Doc, Doc, Professor Dia Pujari. I know you 
you champion the endoscope. What's your thoughts on exoscope for these tumors? So we uh, used exoscope. Uh, I I mean I can tell you that uh, in brainstem surgery I have used it only for one pilocytic astrocytoma, uh, and uh, uh, now with uh, 3D exoscopes available, it is probably very similar. It's mainly a question of uh, uh, it's a little less cumbersome. You don't have to strain your neck, but otherwise I think uh, surgery remains more or less the same and more. Uh, Conversant you get with endoscope, I think your ability to operate with exoscope also uh, increases. But to tell you frankly, I think I'm more comfortable operating with a microscope if I'm dealing with a brainstem tumor, even if it is anteriorly and uh, use uh, uh, endoscope towards the end of surgery to make sure that I've done a good resection. And uh... That's great. Thanks. Thank you very much. So I will just uh, first of all um, thank the participants for uh, joining us. Uh, you know, this is for you, and thank. You. It's great to have so many of you from so many countries. Fifty-two countries we had registrations from, and uh, then I would like to thank uh, all the faculty, Professor Dio Pujari. Thank you, sir, again, and Dr. Mukherjee. Uh, I appreciate this is a Sunday, and you making your time, um, you know, for a subject. Uh, to teach us and give your thoughts and to uh, uh, ask questions to Dr. Baird. And Dr. Jason Chang, once again, thank you very much for your input. It's really uh, good for neurosurgeons. And as, as, as Dr. Baird said, the exoscope, and in the same way, this neuropathology is running so fast, trying to, trying to understand them uh, so that we are not you know, out of the loop. And it's good to have the conversations. And thank you very much, Dr. Gillian uh, Whitfield. Uh, it's really great to have your input and from the radiotherapy and uh, point of view and your contributions to these discussions. I hope uh, you all like this format of MDT multidisciplinary meetings and uh, I will contact you again. And I hope that we can have this as a series. And I I'll really, if you think this is something worthwhile, it will be great to carry on. So. And lastly, Dr. Baird, thank you very much for this fantastic lecture. And and um, uh, you know, we learned a lot. And uh, you brought uh, uh, you know the great faculty with your lecture to join us, and all these participants from every part of the world. Uh, it will be it's, it will be already on the YouTube by the time we finish. I will send you all the all you the links. And um, thank you again. And I want to leave Dr. Dio Pujari to make the final comments. Uh, Dr. Dio Pujari, thank you. Sir. I think it's been a uh, thanks, uh, Narin, for uh, involving all of us. I think it was really a good multidisciplinary, and Lisa herself gave us a very good overview. And I think many points were discussed right there. Uh, Dr. Mukherjee has uh, put a lot of questions uh, for us, and I think uh, we'll probably find uh, are we going the right way very soon. But yes, we. I think all of us realize that. Uh, the newer pathology has given us better insights to treat our patients for sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, and wishing you a great rest of the day and look forward to seeing you all soon again. Bye for now. Thank you, Naren. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.